Hello, welcome in to the Brave in the Attempt podcast. I'm your host, Wyatt Spaulding, and today we're joined by independent provider, Sarah Birch. Sarah, how's it going? Wonderful. I'm super happy to be here. Yeah. It's a little background story on Sarah and I. She used to work for Special Olympics Nebraska, and when I went to my first Special Olympics USA Games, Sarah was the one that I had to follow around because I got to do something for like the opening ceremonies and I just remember getting there and we didn't get to eat any of the food like anybody else I was starving I remember <laughs> you were a super big deal so you had to go to a rehearsal and everyone else went to dinner and we missed dinner for that night <laughs> yeah I know like it's you me and Isaiah and mm -hmm. it's just like they had all the pizza and it's like dang we didn't get <laughs> any food we got nothing you yeah. guys were too and you had to go to an extra rehearsal and we didn't get fed <laughs> until like late that night we did get to like sit in the football stadium so that was kind of cool like so there was that but and you got to be on stage with Tay Diggs you yeah, know, no I know right <laughs> I, I like watch his show sometimes all, all American or whatever I always forget like oh yeah I met that guy <laughs> <laughs> so so Sarah why don't you go into like telling us a little about yourself and where you're from yeah, so I am originally from Wisconsin. Um, I actually had my first uh, job when I was a college student in Wisconsin for Special Olympics Wisconsin. Um, I was just a sophomore in college. I had just declared my major of recreational therapy, never really having worked a lot with people with disabilities, but I like to be active and I like to be outside and rec therapy let you um, do all of those things and um, get other people involved in it who might not be able to be involved otherwise. Um, so I declared the major and I had worked at day camps before uh, in my hometown of Racine. So uh, Special Olympics Wisconsin in La Crosse was looking to start an inclusive day camp for individuals with and without disabilities. I learned later on that that was uh, what's called a Camp Shriver, modeled after Eunice Kennedy Shriver's camp that she started in her backyard, which is kind of how the whole Special Olympics started in the first place. Um, I honestly thought I was going to the interview to get good interview experience because I did not think there was any way they would give me that job because I had no experience other than working at a YMCA day camp. Uh, but they offered it to me and I got to um, kind of design this day camp from the ground up um, and figure out what was going to help kiddos with and without disabilities come together and get to play and go to camp and do things and learn together. Um, so that was my first experience in Wisconsin. I loved it. It was wildly successful. We were shooting for between 50 and 75 kids to come in that first year. And we had 125. Um, we, I just learned so much so quickly about how accepting kids can be when you just put them together and offer the support needed to let them play and be kids mm -hmm. side by side. Um, and so that's kind of been my passion ever since then. Um, so I graduated with a rec therapy degree. I ended up moving to Atlanta and then to Tennessee, um, working in different fields. Um, I ended up getting my master's in special education because I really wanted to help kids in public schools. I wanted to reach them before they needed, um, like I was working at a treatment facility for kids with behavioral disorders, um, doing rec therapy and being outside, but I wanted to get into public schools and help kids at a younger age. So when I got my special ed degree, I ended up moving to Omaha. And uh, ever since then, have been really involved in Special Olympics Nebraska. I've gotten to coach several teams. I've gotten to um, work for the state office, like you said. I was the regional director for a couple of years. Um, and it, I mean, Omaha is just a really special community. Uh, Special Olympics Nebraska is, you know, even though there's 
thousands of athletes that compete in Special Olympics, it feels like a small community when you go to tournaments and you, you know, know people, they remember you, you've, you know, done this together, all of these different connections that you have. So I think Omaha is where, where I'm going to stay with all the, all the moving that I've done. Yeah, nice. Yeah, because like, didn't you like, you work for Special Olympics? Then didn't you move and then come back again or something? I did. Yeah. I, my parents tried to convince me that I should go back to Wisconsin for a bit about five years ago. And I worked for Special Olympics Wisconsin again at the state office in Madison. Um, and I made it about nine months and I really wanted to come back to Omaha. I just, oh, wow. um, it's a, it's, it just, there's so many different programs for individuals with disabilities that all, um, you know, like support each other's events, put out social media to support someone else's, you know, talent show or, or tournament or, you know, things like that. There's, it's just, it's a really special community and I like being a part of it. And I like um, getting to be surrounded by other people who are so passionate about the mission of um, acceptance and inclusion for people with disabilities. So yeah. this is where, this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. well, uh... Glad you came back to Nebraska. So, <laughs> so uh, coaching, what have you, uh, what lessons have you learned from the athletes, unified and, you know, the athletes with disabilities from coaching them and how they compete compared to like, just like your average high school event? Yeah. So um, I love coaching. I was, I was trying to prep myself for this conversation and remember all of the different sports I've coached at a different time <laughs> or, and it's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty close to all of them. I've never done like snowshoeing or downhill skiing or things like that. Mm. But other than that, I'm, I'm pretty versed in uh, the sports of special Olympics and I've coached uh, traditional teams as well as unified teams. Um, I think the biggest lesson I think I think the biggest takeaway is just it's an environment that is so welcoming and enthusiastic that it just makes you want to come back and be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Special Olympics removes so many boundaries for individuals with disabilities um, that, you know, we have skills competitions if you're not ready to be a part of like team basketball or team football we have um different avenues we have walking events for swimming if you're not you know swimming in a pool yet it just removes so many barriers that i think those individuals with disabilities are so excited that they get to um be a part of a team in a way that's meaningful to them they can compete at their level they can progress and move forward but we will meet you where you are and build those skills um and i think those those welcoming elements translate when you're on a unified team um we have a lot of you know i've i've coached in middle schools and high schools and even adult teams um, and we have high school athletes that might play a different sport at the varsity level, but they love coming to Special Olympics practices because of that environment, because they feel like they can be themselves. There's not, you know, a ton of pressure to, to perform and be perfect and, you know, do all those things. Not that it's not competitive, because all mm -hmm. of the teams I've been a part of, you know, they want to win, they want to compete, but there's not that disappointment feeling if you make a mistake or if you if you don't do it perfectly so I just think um that that environment of positivity and inclusion and um just welcomeness is something that is unlike anything any other team I've ever been a part of so that's that's my favorite part and I think that's what keeps me coming back and that's what keeps a lot of individuals coming back and wanting to be a part of Special Olympics yeah for sure like I know, like, my twin brother, Wes, and, and our best friend, Kenny, like, they were involved, and, you know, they loved coaching. They were our coaches for traditional right away, and my brother loved it because he, he thought about being a basketball coach. So I was like, yeah, it's a great way to, like, do it in high school and see if you really want to be a coach. He's like, yeah. I definitely learned, like, patience and, okay, I can coach this athlete this way and this athlete yeah. another way. But then, yeah. like, yeah, like, Unify was fun because, you know, um, it's also, like, kind of having another coach out on the floor so like if you need some help, where do you want you need to be? Or like I'm not gonna lie, like playing quarterback 
if nobody was looking, I knew the unified player was always looking. <laughs> was just like, I was just like, with someone to bail me out before I got sacked. And <laughs> I was just, yeah. yeah. So yeah, unified is, you know, we wouldn't grow without, without unified. I don't think we would be where we are today, but they're both great. Like, I mean, I like coaching traditional is fun because you don't know what's going to happen. There's no <laughs> unified player to like, all right, let's all set up. It's like, all right, what's going to happen here? Who's going to make a play? It's like the person yeah. that doesn't make a shot, a deep three all all season in practice, just starts making them in practice. Like, what is happening? <laughs> and that's something that's so hard to explain. I try and explain that to my new coaches, yeah. Um, you know, because Special Olympics is unlike other uh, sports where you don't have league games. Like, you right. don't get to assess week to week. Like, oh, we're ready for the tournament. Oh, whatever. You have eight weeks of practice or 12 weeks of practice, and then you walk into that tournament. That's a really big deal. And it might mean you qualify for state or, you know, like there's there's big um, consequences or rewards from it. And our athletes are so used to that format that so many of them turn on a tournament player that you didn't see the whole season in practice Yeah, um, because they know, they know what they're working towards and they might be saving it up or they're, um, you know, they just get more competitive when their parents are watching or their grandparents are watching or something like that. Yeah. Um, new coaches are, you know, they think they have such a plan going into the tournament. And then once we get there, they're like, well, I don't know what I like. They, they just do all the things they know how to do it now. And we couldn't do that in practice. So um, yeah, it's definitely a different kind of style and format that you kind of get used to as you're more a part of the team. And the other part too, that I, you reminded me of is it challenges coaches to, do more than just their one thing you know mm -hmm. like when you hear some like college coaches or NFL coaches they'll say yep like this is my philosophy and this is the way that things work that doesn't work in Special Olympics because you have to find what works for every athlete and it's not their fault if they're not fitting into your system yeah. you need to find a way to communicate or to demonstrate or to model and so I think it really challenges coaches to be the best version of themselves to think outside the box and to come up with new drills and skills and things like that so um it's a good challenge too yeah it's never like not exciting because the athletes may say something on the sideline that it's kind of funny or it's like oh yeah <laughs> that was pretty motivational or or like uh something will happen like one year, my brother had a coach. I was sick, so he had to put someone else in at quarterback. He called the pass play, and he ran the ball and scored. He called the run play, but he, he passed it, and we scored. And he's like, well, <laughs> I guess that works. <laughs> so. Yep, and it's kind of hard to, you know, you can't really uh, redirect it when they're scoring because of it. Yeah, like, exactly. it's difficult to be like, no, do what I said, but good job on scoring a yeah, touchdown. it's just like, <laughs> well, good job. I like, even went on the board, so. Yep. So, so let's talk about so your job now is you're an independent provider and maybe go into detail of what all that entails. Yeah, so um, I was a special education teacher. Um, while I was still teaching, I had um, some students that had moved out of my classroom that they needed um, like a significant level of support uh, from their parents or their grandparents or whoever it was that they were living with. Um, so the state of Nebraska provides uh, waivers for individuals who need that support kind of around the clock um, so that they can employ an independent provider such as myself to come in and help with, um, you know, dinner, showers, whatever, whatever that individual needs. So I was doing that while I was teaching full time and I was working three, four nights a week, sometimes the whole weekend, and then still going back to teaching the next day. Um, so it got to be quite a bit yeah, yeah. <laughs> of work for me, um, mainly just because the need is so much. There's so many individuals who need good independent providers, mm -hmm. and it's not a career path that is um, well known or talked about, or, you know, so um, once people found out that I was an independent provider, the the number of clients who were asking me, you know, to work with them just went up right away. So I got to a point where um, I felt like I was ready for a transition with teaching. 
and I wanted to go into doing this full time. Um, so I talked to the families that I was already working with and worked out, you know, a schedule of how much time I would spend with each of their kiddos to kind of create my own, um, full-time job, uh, which was very scary because I don't work for an organization. I don't have someone giving me health insurance. I don't have, you know, the things that you just kind of think of with a full-time job. Um, but I get to make my own schedule. I get to work with the clients and the families that I want to work with. Um, and I get to, you know, all of the clients that I started with were individuals that I knew in my classroom, but the relationship that you can make with them when you get that one-on-one -on -one time for, you know, four hours every week or eight hours every week or whatever it is, the amount that I got to know them and their, um, you know, nuances, like what, what they liked, what they didn't like. And I wasn't constantly distracted by, you know, a kid throwing something or, you know, needing my attention for this. Um, the relationships I got to build were just so much deeper. So, um, yeah, as soon as I made that decision, we had several, uh, new clients contact me and, you know, wanted support. So I've gotten to grow, um, to about 12 clients that I work with now. Um, we're also, a, an extended family home, um, which means we have an individual who lives with us. Um, our, our rate most shared, uh, or supported, tell me the right word. What am I not saying right, Wyatt? Shared supported, living provider? Shared living provider or supportive living? I have no idea. Supportive My mom's, living. Yeah, that's it. My mom okay. says either or I can't remember because she's my provider and it's like, yes, I don't know. It's all complicated to me. Like. Yes, it is. <laughs> so a shared living provider is another um, benefit of being on a waiver. Um, so because the state wants individuals with disabilities to be as independent as possible, they will per they will pay providers to open up their home shared living um, to individuals with disabilities. So that's what we did. Um, we, most individuals stay in their home for five days a week. The client that we took on, um, it was the way that we kind of wanted to structure it because I had so many other clients I still wanted to work with. And because she, my client is very, very close with her family and they have more baby showers and weddings and birthdays every weekend than anyone I've ever met in my life. <laughs> So it just worked out for her to stay with us five days a week and then go home to um, to her parents' house two days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also kind of that first step to independence because she's never lived away from her parents before. Um, so being with us five days a week is just kind of what worked well. Um, so yeah, so I'm an independent provider. I, I, you know, one individual lives with me. Some of my individuals, I go into their home. Some of my individuals come into our Tim and Mai's home. Um, some of them we go out into the community and go grocery shopping. So there's just a ton of flexibility. Um, and you really get to know your clients so much better and design programs and work that really are specific to that individual and something that they really enjoy doing with you. So it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of the skills I used teaching in a classroom, just kind of in a different environment now. Yeah. And What's cool is like, what you know, you don't even have a family member that has a disability and you still want to do this because a lot of it is like family. And like, yeah. it's like my provider is my mom. But then like I've heard stories where like you try to hire someone outside the family and then I don't know, like the system just sometimes it's tough and yeah. then they don't want to do it anymore or they don't show up. And so it's nice that someone like you, like they show up for the client every day, like they know you're going to pick them up. And then like, like you said, independence, like I would love to, you know, move out and leave the room apartment or do like they have, you were my provider and I did your house several days a week. Cause it does. It's like when your parents are provided, you know, it's good. Cause no one's going to advocate more for you than your parents, but you still like, they, you know, you live there for 18 years and it's just like, all right, can I go now or not? Or... <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I think, I think there's a big stigma with that too. Um, like I know, especially when I was teaching in middle school, I would have a lot of parents that would say, well, my child, uh, they're my child. They're going to stay with me forever. I would never, you know, send them to a group home or, um, you know, something like that. And it's like, you're not, you're not abandoning your adult 
child with a disability. You're you're supporting them in their step of independence. It just looks different for them. You know, like no one thought you were a bad mom when you sent your typical developing child to college. No one thought that that was you abandoning them. Like, yeah. I think it's just, uh, spreading awareness of what those steps of independence can look like for individuals with disabilities. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, you know, I, I, I don't have a, a sibling with a disability. I know that's how a lot of people get into it. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I love getting to help people reach their full potential. I love getting to see, you know, what they're capable of when they have the right supports in place. And I just think if more people knew that this was a career path or a job opportunity or something that they could be doing, like I said, you could do it part-time um, on top of your full-time job. It can be as few or as many hours a week as you want it to be based on you and your client and your arrangement. So I just think if more people knew about it, um, there would be more people interested in doing it. And like you said, the need is there. Like there are so many individuals that would love to have a provider, would love to have someone to spend time with. Um, like I, one of my friends who's a provider, he took um, his client out for her 28th birthday because she wanted to spend it with, you know, with someone outside of her family because she's 28. She doesn't yeah. want to go out to dinner with her parents. She wants to meet a friend and have her provider take her so she can feel, you know, independent. Like that's, that's what it's all about is, is it going to look like a typical developing 28 year old? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But are there steps we can take to move towards independence? Absolutely. You know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it like, uh, I know, like, no, we're not super cool about in health, but, like, mental health, like, it's just kind of nice, like, oh, I have this friend, I can hang out with them, you know, like you said, they're not part of my immediate family, which I see all the time, you know, it's just, like, nice to, like, you know, go get something to eat with someone, go to the movies or play sports or something, because sometimes Special Olympics is, like, our only social activity of the whole week. Yeah. Which, someone outside the immediate family so you have that provider at least you got like maybe three other times so that is <laughs> nice like you yeah. know and not that like parents aren't bad like everyone you know your parents gonna stick up for you the most but like I said earlier it's just like independence you want to like I always told my parents I want to live near you guys I just don't want to live with you <laughs> like well and I think I think that's the other thing too you know speaking for myself when I left our house and went to college, my relationship with my parents got way better. We are not meant to live together. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like it, it allows you, if you have a provider or you have, um, you know, a supported living environment, when you spend time with your parents, they just get to be your parents. They don't have to uh, mother you like they did when you were 12. You know, you're not mm -hmm. talking about cleaning up your room or unloading the dishwasher. Like you just get to spend time together like adults, like parents do with their other adult children. So I really think it can help that relationship um, of get, letting you be an adult and have your own space and letting them, you know, have the good parts about being parents of an adult child yeah for sure and i mean i've told my parents that too like how yeah, someday when i move out our relationship our relationship is good now but even better when i move out because i'll yeah. actually miss you guys and i'll probably text you or whatever every day but you know i won't live with you but i mean you know it just takes time like i think everyone's disability is different some move out right at 18 some 28 30 years old but you know that's I would say a lot of us, that's like our main goal in life is just to be independent with, for a lot of us, like my siblings, like that was never like a big dream of theirs. Cause like they knew they were going to get kicked out. <laughs> so yeah. for me, it was like, I lived in a dorm for when I went to college and that was kind of it. Then when I was done with college, I moved back home. So, yeah. But, and I think that too is, you know, again, something that the, the, the wider culture outside of the people with disabilities culture doesn't understand is such a need and a desire for right. individuals with disabilities. Um, in Omaha, you know, we have something called Sheltering Tree, which is an apartment complex designed for individuals with disabilities. And they started, you know, with this very small apartment complex in Benson. And very quickly, they have 
hundreds, I'm guessing, I don't work for Sheltering Tree, but I know it's a lot of individuals on the wait list who want this opportunity. And so they've been building, you know, new apartment complexes to try and meet that need. Um, but I don't think, I don't think people realize how strong that desire is for a lot of individuals to have that independence. And we as a society, even in Omaha, who I think is a very inclusive culture and has a lot of, um, you know, day programs, Special Olympics programs, um, activities, community inclusion groups. Um, but we don't have a lot of living options um, yeah. that offer that little bit of support that people need um, to be as independent as possible. So it's just continuing to get that word out there of what what you guys need to be successful. Yeah, like I've looked in the, the Living Tree place and yeah, there is like a huge wait list. I think <laughs> last time I looked at it, it was like a year or two. Maybe yeah. Get in. So, I mean, but I mean, that's good too, because that shows like, you know, we're not just, you know, comfortable living at home. Like it is more comfortable, like living with your parents, they're all financially, like in yeah. my case. And, you know, when you go on your own, you're just like, okay, I'm probably gonna have to live a different life, but I'll be independent. And yeah. so, and, and you still have your family there to help you out at, every now and then. But yeah, I think it proves like, you know, someone that doesn't have disability, you know, their dream is something in their career or whatever, or get people like, like me, like our main dream is li in life is just to live on our own. And you yeah. wouldn't think it'd be that hard, but yeah. depending on what your situation is, it can be extremely hard sometimes. Yep. So. Well, and just, and just having the option available, you know, like every person with a disability might not want to move out. It might not be their dream, um, yeah. but you deserve to have the option, just like every other person deserves to have the option of how they want to live their life. Um, hopefully we will continue to grow those opportunities so that individuals who do want to live on their own with a little bit of support have that chance. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. when you go out into the community with your clients or just anybody with a disability, how do you think they're perceived by just the outside world? Like, do they treat you the same? Do they treat them the same as they would treat you? Or I, I know we've talked about this before, but it, Sometimes it's not always like that. And, and um, both of us a lot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite. So when I, when I left teaching, I had um, a, a group of girls that I was so close with them and their family that we started doing girls nights because I just, I needed to still see them and spend time with them. Um, and if it wasn't going to be in the classroom, I was going to figure out a way to do this. So we started with girls nights. There was four individuals. And uh, this was before I was a provider. I was not getting paid for doing this. I just loved these kids and I wanted to give their family, you know, a little bit of a break. And I wanted um, these girls that I had taught in the classroom to keep building these skills, to be able to order for themselves in a restaurant, to be able to, you know, pay for a movie or something like that. So that's what we would do. We would go out to dinner. Um, we went and got a manicure one time. We went to the movies, like just thing, you know, high school girls would do. And whenever not every time, but almost every time I would be out with this group. Me, obviously, as the adult and high school individuals with visible disabilities, mm -hmm. someone would come up to me and be like, what's what's the name of this group or what organization do you work for? And I'm like, this is me, Sarah Birch, just in the community with some kids I really like, you know, like they couldn't they couldn't understand that I wasn't working for someone to do this, that I was just choosing to do this because I enjoyed spending time with them. Um, so that one always sticks with me because like you said, people, if you're not directly related or working, they don't understand yeah. why it would just be fun to spend time with a group of individuals with disabilities. Those girls nights are my favorite <laughs> activities that I do. Um, and I think people don't, don't understand that because they've never experienced it themselves. Yeah. Um, and I, and I have had really nice people. There's been on more than one occasion, um, where somebody has like bought our whole dinner because they see us out in the community and they, you know, appreciate that these girls are getting the chance to come out and be social, um, which is super nice. I never expect anything like that to happen. 
Um, and there are people who, you know, come up and say hi and, and want to give my kiddos more chances to socialize and to interact, which is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I would like to happen more than anything is just people who come up and say hi and ask them how their night's going or ask them what they're doing so that they get that chance to socialize with someone that they don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so that I love it when that happens. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's the not great experiences where, you know, uh, like I said, they're working on ordering for themselves or speaking up for themselves. And, you know, the waiter or waitress or guy behind the counter will only make eye contact with me and he'll ask me what they want. Um, and even after I go, I don't know, what do you want? And, you know, give the attention back to them. They'll still come right back to me with the next question. Um, but I think it's about... Um, awareness you know like we just we have to make more people aware that individuals with disabilities can speak up for themselves they can order for themselves and if they can't still make eye contact with them and talk to them and as as an adult who's with them or a staff person I will step in if they need help but don't you just assume that they can't speak for themselves. You know, you give them the respect of any other person who comes into your restaurant or your shop. Um, and then anybody who's with them offering support is going to know what to do to help them. But you respect them as a human being who's come into your business. Yeah, I know. You know, I could go on about that yeah, all day. We That's could, do, we could do like an hour <laughs> of this, but yeah. yeah, it is like, it's frustrating. Like, I guess my experience, like, I hung out with a group. I was the only one with a disability in high school in the group because my brother and I played the same sports and had the same friends. But yeah, yeah it was different. Like they talked to me different or I'd get weird looks or whatever. And then like, you know, it helped because like, you, I mean, you could tell that my brother and I were brothers. I thought we were twins. We gave credit to the people though that thought we were twins though. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're like good. Like yeah, it's just like that's pretty good because we were supposed to be identical. And then yeah. so but yeah, just like you know, I mean I think you and I talked about it like like for me, like when I start talking, it's like, oh, they might feel really dumb because they just <laughs> talk to me like I was six. And but but then yeah. it too, like you I could talk and they still talk to me like that because they see my hand and I'm yeah. physically challenged and it's just like well, I can't hide it. I mean, it's very hard to. So, but yeah, I don't know. People talk people talk about how they want us to like be like everybody else. And there are people that do that, but then they're probably, if you look at the world, there are a majority that don't. And it's like, so why would you want us to be like everybody else when you don't even treat us like everyone yeah. else? I mean, it's it's frustrating and sometimes you're like, Oh, I just want to be a jerk right now to their face, but it's just <laughs> like be a good person don't say anything yeah yeah <laughs> well, gonna... well and I, I honestly think that both ends of the spectrum annoy me equally because when someone doesn't even look at my kiddos with a disability that drives me nuts you know like but also when you tell me that my individual with a disability is an inspiration for like buying a movie ticket like pump the brakes. You don't need to, you don't need to act like it's such a big deal that she can walk into a movie theater. You know, no one else did you call an inspiration for yeah. walking into a movie theater and buying a ticket. So I just wish we could, we could land in the middle of those things. And what's in the middle, I think is treating you like every other person, you know, like it yeah. sounds so simple, and I think it's, I don't know if it's like a comfort level or they, they just don't really know what to say. So they just go really over the top with like talking loud or talking slow or, t you know, but it's just like, you don't have to be nervous to talk to a person with a disability. Like just say hi to them. Like you would say hi to anybody else. It's yeah. not like, don't overthink it. It's not that hard. Yeah, exactly. It's like, maybe they don't want to say anything offensive. I don't know, but um, like, it's just like, some people with disabilities are like the most blunt people I know and they're not going to care. Like, yeah. like they, I don't like me. I, I don't care. You want to ask me a question. If, if you were wrong, it's not going to offend me. Like, but um, like as a kid, it was always like, Oh, what's wrong with your hand as a kid that would bug you. 
Like, cause it's like, stop asking me that. But yeah. you know, now as an adult, like, you know, I'll just tell them or if I kind of know them a little bit, I'll like make something up. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, I think like there are more people that give people with disabilities a chance like, like you. And obviously like if your immediate family, cause that's easy. Cause they're always around you, but, and then special Olympics helps, but you know, yeah. I think still it's like, they just see us as, oh, we have a disability. We're out with someone because we can't be out by ourselves. And it's like, it's just like you going out. Do you want to go hang out by yourself or do you want to hang out in a group? So, yep. Yep. I yep. don't know. And I, and I do definitely think on a positive, um, you know, like the Unified Champion Schools that Special Olympics does, um, especially in Omaha, I think is, is very impactful yeah. and is making a difference for the way that... Uh, the general, you know, general education, general population views individuals with disabilities, that um, same group I took to a pizza place in Millard, all of Millard's high schools are unified champion schools. Um, I think all of their middle schools are too, and most of their elementary schools. So like these, these opportunities are becoming more and more available to interact with people with disabilities, to play sports with them, to go to a field day, to be in a unified club. Um, and I, you know, when they went up to the counter and they saw that they had a Millard, I think it was a Millard West shirt on, the person behind the counter was like, oh, I go to Millard South. Do you do unified bowling? Like, right. you know, just went straight into a conversation because they had that experience and they had that common um, common activity to talk about. Um, so I definitely think the more exposure that we can have in schools and, you know, while people are still developing their opinions of the world and of, you know, the people around them, the more that we can get into schools, the better it is. And then hopefully that will roll into adults who want to be unified partners or adults mm -hmm. who want to coach and be involved or be independent providers or just have a friend with a disability that they go to the movies with because it's not, it's not, you know, not um, uncomfortable for them yeah. to just spend time with a person with a disability. So I definitely hope and think that we're moving in the right direction um, with the exposure that the unified champion schools program is providing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, when I was in high school, I had to convince all my friends to come to my game. I got <laughs> my best friend to come, and then in the middle schools, and slowly, you know, in high school, my brother and I got all our friends. But if there was unified schools, it would have been a lot easier because yeah. it would have been a part of the school. And now it's like in some colleges, Creighton and, you know, Nebraska, they have – I play in the UNL League on Wednesday nights, and that's really fun to play with, like, college students. I played uh, in a – football tournament this last weekend with a couple of UNL students and it was fun. I mean, yeah. and it's just like, it's just like going out to eat or something like playing sports. It's another way for you to be independent. Like you're not with your parents, you're with your peers with disabilities and college or high school students that don't have disabilities. And you're just like anybody else. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's been huge and I can't wait to see it grow. Through special yeah. Olympics. So and yeah. I see like more teams, like, isn't it like, is it the Papillion schools? They have like a rivalry game every uh -huh. year yep. or something. I was like, that'd be cool to see more of that. Like some of the Millard schools play each other and yep. it's just cool. Millard South and Millard West have a have a rivalry basketball game. It's called uh the Q Street Classic because yeah, they're yeah. both on um yeah and then it's a whole school assembly so like even if you're not on the unified basketball team or unified bowling team like you get to see what it's about you get to um be a part of it and so I just think as those you know individuals graduate from high school and and are working in businesses or things like that like it'll only help um the uh, people with disabilities community that yeah. there's more exposure, there's more understanding and there's people who are more accepting. Um, yeah. I mean, it can, hopefully it can only continue to get better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what have you learned through like your experience from college to now just, you know, being friends with people with disabilities and like lessons you've learned from them. And I bet you've taught them all lessons too, but what have you learned from people <laughs> with disabilities? Um, well, wow, what a great question that is so broad and so difficult for me to formulate an answer to. Um, 
I mean, I really, I really think that working with people with disabilities has, I mean, more than just a singular lesson, I think it brings out the best version of myself. I think working with people with disabilities has truly turned me into the person that I'm supposed to be. So, I mean, it's not a direct answer to your question, but mm -hmm. um, showing up every day, being positive, uh, trying my best, taking on skills that I don't think I can accomplish, um, you know, not giving up perseverance, all skills that I see in my Special Olympics athletes, um, just trying to apply that to my own life. And, um, you know, like you, I don't know, you go to a Special Olympics practice and you're having a bad day because, you know, traffic was bad or I didn't get all my grading done or my progress reports are due or all those things. And in no way, you know, I know a lot of people say that people with disabilities or especially people with Down syndrome are happy all the time. That's not true. Mm -hmm. They're, they're people, they're, they have bad days. Um, but when people are seeing them at a special Olympics tournament or practice or out in the community having dinner or something like that, yeah, they're probably happy because that, like you said, that's usually the best part of their whole week. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing this super happy, joyful person. Um, and it's, there's, they, they have so much fewer inhibitions, you know, like that joy is so pure. And so like they, their emotions, whether it's happy or sad, they're big emotions. They feel things really deeply and just let that come out. And so I, you know, try to let go of any of the other things that are happening when I see one of my athletes or one of my clients and just focus on being present and what is there to be happy about right now? What is there to be positive about that we can focus on? Um, and yeah, it makes, I mean, it just makes me a better person. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, like, <laughs> I think it's having good providers like you and my mom and other people like it makes us good people too. They're like, oh somebody actually cares so yeah it's just uh really nice that you spend a lot of time with this and the in your job but also outside your job like you said you did <laughs> hung out with those girls like it wasn't a job we were just hanging out so yeah but thanks for joining us on brave in the, in the attempt podcast and um good luck with all your stuff with special olympics and what are you coaching right now basketball we are in, we are actually doing powerlifting uh, oh, yeah. for the first time in a long time. Madonna's nice. doing powerlifting. That has been super fun. We have a small group of like, I think there's four of, no, five of them on the team who have never done powerlifting before. And it is so much fun. Um, but yeah, we'll start basketball and swimming after uh, the holidays and go into that very, very busy, busy. Yeah. We have three basketball teams and like, like 20 swimmers so that's our that's our right. busy season yeah I'm definitely powerlifting coming up in December and I'm excited to go to it I've never been I'm not doing powerlifting but I'm gonna try to interview some of the athletes and uh, yeah uh, I've never been to powerlifting so I'm pumped to go it should be fun yeah. so. well I appreciate you having me Wyatt and you hosting this podcast and talking to people about it definitely helps bring awareness to the the greater community. So I appreciate what you're doing and I feel super special to be able to be on here with you. So thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. So absolutely.